most amazing experience on the shore of the most famous sea in Israel, and that is the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. It's actually a lake which the Israelites call Lake Gennesaret. You see, when I was there, when I was walking on the sandy shore, and I was uh, riding the, the boat in the Sea of Galilee, it seemed that time stood still. And there was that feeling of surreal, that um, images of events that happened some 2,000 years ago flooded my mind. So I thought I saw Jesus walking down the sandy shore, approaching two fishermen who were casting their nets. And a little down farther, I saw Jesus approaching two other fishermen in their boats, mending their nets. And I think I, I thought I heard Jesus say, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This morning, God put in my heart the message, the invitation of Jesus to become, all of us to become fishers of men. How? Okay. You see, um, our text for today is um, on the Gospel of Mark, Matthew 4, verses 17 to 22. If you have your Bibles, you can open your Bibles and read with me. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, so two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw another <coughs> brother, James, the son of Zebedee, their father, attending their nets. He called them. Okay. So after John the Baptist had prepared the way, after Jesus' baptism, and after his um, temptation, Jesus finally embarked on his uh, earthly ministry, and that is to seek and save the lost. Okay. So when Jesus uh, started his ministry, he called his disciples. I mean, yeah, his first disciples. And these were the people who would be hearers and witnesses to his teachings and to his miracles, who afterwards would testify about them. Okay. But you know what? Jesus didn't go to the court of King Herod. He didn't go to Jerusalem where the scribes and the religious leaders were. Instead, he went to the Sea of Galilee among the fishermen. just happy and contented to call themselves Christians, but they don't have, they have little or nothing, no intent to follow Jesus. Okay. Now when Jesus first called his disciples, he made the promise that he would, they would become fishers of man's soul. That is to get others to follow Jesus. But when Jesus first called them, 
These men were not, at that time, the kind of men Jesus wanted them to be. Remember, they were just fishermen. They were poor. They were uneducated. That is, they didn't have any rabbinic training. And maybe they had very little a spiritual perception. And because they were out there men, maybe they could have been loud and harsh and rough. But God looked beyond what they were. Because Jesus was more concerned of what they would become. Yeah. So the important thing to remember is that when Jesus calls, he equips, he enables, he empowers. Now, I will make you fishers of men. So in a sense, Jesus was saying, I will teach you how. Okay? So Jesus did not just send them right away out to the walls. He prepared them. He taught them. He trained them. He lived with them and taught them by example. So the disciples, by their fellowship with Jesus, by listening to his words, by, minister, uh, by <clears throat> listening to his or witnessing his miracles, and by their reliance on his grace, Jesus caused them to be like him. So, he sent them out two by two. Remember, they were sent two by two. And when these disciples became fully trained as soul winners, Jesus said, you are now on your own. Okay. But sometimes we couldn't help but ask, why in the world would Jesus choose poor and educated fishermen to be his partners in his team to preach the gospel. Why didn't he choose like Pastor Ben or the ministers or Charles uh, Stanley? They were like get born that kind of life. Now, simply because Jesus can see the hearts of men. Jesus can read the minds of men. And you know at that time, Jesus had something new to offer. And those people whose hearts and minds are set in the, in the old law, like the Pharisees, like the scribes, they want to be open to his teaching. And at the time, Jesus was looking for men whose hearts were submissive, whose hearts were humble, whose hearts were teachable. And most importantly, hearts that are obedient. Because obedience is the spark that sets one on fire. Right? Okay. So Jesus always identified himself with the people, with the masses. He was always with the poor, and the poor in spirit. Now, in the ancient times, people used three ways of fishing. I don't know if they do it right now. First, they have this circular net, right? A circular net uh, that is about nine feet in diameter. They just cast it on the sea. Another is a drag net. A drag net is used uh, with a boat. They tie each corner of a drag net uh, to a boat, and it is weighted down so that the net would go down into the water. So as the boat rolls, it scoops up the fish. Okay. You see, while the net is an important tool in fishing, the net during uh, those ancient times is also used as a weapon of uh, warfare. Remember how you see in movies about gladiators? Um, when gladiators are fighting, one would hold a net, and the net is thrown against the opponent to entangle him, to trap him. Okay, but the net that we are talking this morning in this context is not a weapon of destruction. 
the net that Jesus would want the apostles or the disciples to use to catch men is the gospel. Okay. Now, if we think we are really saved, the work is just half done. Unless we become active in bringing others to Christ. Yeah. We have not attained the full development of a Christ-like life unless we have begun telling others about the grace of God. Now, fishes of men. Jesus wants his disciples to, to catch men's souls, right? To get others to follow Jesus. So this calling is universal. Now, what Jesus told this man on the beach of Galilee is the same thing that he would want to tell us. Maybe Jesus wants to tell us now. Stop doing what you're doing. Come follow me and fish for people. Instead of fishing for yourselves, for your own satisfaction, fish for the kingdom. Okay, it is not just for food but it is for people. And Jesus wants to tell us too that instead of using our gifts, our passions, our skills for our own benefits, we must use them to bless others. Now, come, follow me. These words of Jesus should resonate in our minds and in our heart. And they should cause us to conduct a soul-searching examination of ourselves as to how much in our lives as Christians we are committed to this calling. Are we laid back or are we lukewarm like the church in the Odyssey? Or have we forgotten our first love like those in Ephesus? You see, the word of evangelism is the purest, the truest, and the noblest work any church will ever do. Evangelism is the job of fishing men out of the sea of sin. It is the job of rescuing people from the fires of hell. And this is God's greatest concern, winning the lost, winning them for his kingdom. Evangelism is the sob of God, S-O-B. Evangelism is the anguished cry of Jesus over Jerusalem. It is the cry of Moses and the other prophets. And even Paul in Romans, the book of Romans said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Now, when Jesus asked his disciples to follow him, what, how did they respond? They followed him right away, right? They put down their nets, that is, they gave up their, their occupation. And even John and James left their father, Zebedee, suggesting that following Jesus takes precedence over maintaining close family ties. Now the question is, how do we influence people to God? How do we bring people to God? First, simply put, our attitude. First Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason of the hope that is in you. See, to illustrate this, it's like, there should be a reflection of joy and peace and hope in our lives, right? So they see you happy, as if you have a problem. Okay, they see you joyful, and people will notice it, and they will ask it. That will open the door for you to share the gospel. Say, for example, 
Sister Lorna, I noticed that you're full of joy, that you never seem worried, that you never complain. What is it? That is your cue, right? You can say, oh, why should I be worried when I have the peace of God that transcends all understanding? Why should I be worried when I know that He will never leave me nor forsake me? Then you can do your spirit and I can do everything to Christ who gives me strength and so on and so forth. Okay. okay. Now, this fisherman, I don't know if this practice is being practiced at present. The fishermen of old are fished not only during the, night, the daytime, but they also fish during the nighttime. And they claim that their best fishing took place at night. So what do fishermen bring at night when they fish? Aside from the net. Light, right, light. Now they claim that uh, the fish are drawn to the light, that the fish are attracted to the light. Is that right? Fishermen. Yeah. The light attracts the fish, so the fish comes near, and they're easily caught in the net. Parallel to that, to this, Jesus said in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Yes? He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Okay. So just as the fish are attracted to the light, Jesus wants us to be attracted to him. He wants us to draw to him because he, of his goodness, of his grace. Now, you see people, true Christians are, are said to be like stained glasses. They sparkle, they shine when the sun is out. And even when the darkness sets in, their true beauty is revealed by the light that comes from within. Okay. Remember, we are not the light, but we simply reflect the light of Jesus. Okay. Matthew, okay, we can also uh, influence others to Jesus by way of our actions. Remember, actions speak louder than a thousand words. Matthew 15, 16, 5, 16 says, let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is Christianity in action. But you see, the world outside defines Christianity by the good works we do. Say for example, here's a guy. He helped an old woman cross the street. Somebody said, Oh, he's a good man. Maybe he's a Christian. Here's another example. A woman bought a homeless man breakfast from McDonald's. And before he uttered his thanks, the man said, you must be a Christian. That's what the guy said. But the sad truth is that in our society, the reputation of Christians is suffering. We seem to be known by the things we hate. You see, we condemn. We are so judgmental about other people. Oh, those abortionists, those gays, those people with tattoos. Oh, look at those scandals among the televangelists. We're so vocal in our judgment. And we are giving Christianity a bad name. We love to call ourselves Christians, okay? But Christianity in action is sharing Jesus with others. But with the way things are going on in this world, where there is so much crime, so much hatred and terrorism and all that, it seems that the Christian faith is only a generation away from extinction. And we don't want to. We don't want that to happen, right? Because we do not want Satan to rule our lives. Because greater is he that is in us 
than he who is in the world. Okay? We therefore need to help others rise from their carnal and sensual state of life. We would like to, we should help them know the one true God so that they are able to worship the true, the, the real true I am. Okay. Now, one way, a very simple way of bringing people to Christ is to invite them to church. Remember, we had our, each one bring one. How many of you brought one? I'm not making you feel guilty at all. Okay. Inviting people to church is not a substitute for evangelism, but it could supplement evangelism. Okay. When we invite people to Christ, it overcomes the obstacle to the evangel evangelism process, which is hostility. Many people reject Jesus because they hate the church. They think Christians are judgmental, close-minded, and hypocritical. They said that when you want to find hypocrites, you can find them in church. That's not from me. That's what I, I heard. Yep. Okay. That's right. Now, but when we bring them to church, right? When we invite them to church, then they, they would be able to see how we Christians love and care for each other. They will be able to see that we are believing as one. We are praying as one. We are serving as one. Right? We are thinking as one. So this will help reduce the hostility they have and it will make them receptive to the gospel. Maybe some of us would be asking, oh Jesus didn't ask me to be a fisher of men. Leave that job to the pastors, to the clergy. But no, every one of us has that mission. Remember the, 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 great, the, greatest, the great commission, Matthew 28 verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you till the end of days. Okay? We are all to speak about Christ. We are all to share Christ to people we know, to our neighbor, to our friends, to our family. Okay. Remember the last words that Jesus told his disciples before he, he ascended to heaven? It has the theme of evangelism. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world, of the earth. Okay. Here is an obligation that falls not only on the apostles or disciples. The obligation that falls not only on the pastors, not only for a chosen few, but for every single member of God's family. Okay. Every one of us whose life is touched by the grace of God should function as a fisher of men. I would like to share this uh, a short story about Moody, an evangelist. Uh, Moody, an evangelist, was in an art gallery. He was standing in front of a painting, and the painting was uh, entitled Rock of Ages. Now, the picture showed a man holding to a cross. The cross was embedded on a rock. He was holding on tightly to the cross. As the stormy sea smashed the rock, he held tightly to the cross. So there was a message there. You get the message? You lose your trust in the Lord, right? He said, oh, that's a beautiful picture. It has a message. Years later, 
he saw a similar picture, but this time, just a little twist in it. The picture showed the, a man with one hand holding on to the cross, and the cross was stuck in a, a, in a rock, okay? And, and his other hand was reaching out to a drowning man. As the sea, as the storm is his mast on the rock, one hand was on the cross, another hand was saving a drowning man. Isn't that a beautiful picture that we don't live for ourselves alone? So, Oh, I made my message as brief as possible. <laughs> so, I'll close on this. As Christians, therefore, we must have the eyes that can see the best in people. We must have the heart that can forgive even the worst. We must have a mind that will never forget that we are fishers of men. And we must have a soul that never loses faith in God. Thank you and Shalom.